chapter five, visual media, photography, movies, and television. Let's get started with photography. All right, so photography is the process of fixing an image in time throughout through using the action of light. So think about how it's just a snapshot into time. There are uh, two main ways that photographs are taken, either using film or digitally. So with the film camera, they are recording on to actual piece of film, usually rolled up into a canister like this. There's not a lot of film cameras around anymore uh, nowadays. Uh, most everybody is digital now, so it's going to save it digitally with a bunch of ones and zeros as digital information, either on some type of external or internal device. So uh, most of us are doing digital nowadays. What is the function of photography? The book has told us this with uh, throughout the book. So um, the two functions for photography would be surveillance and cultural transmission. Think about all of the things from history that we think of in a photograph. You see that photograph in your mind. Definitely cultural transmission. And of course, surveillance. We can talk about some of the things that have happened in the past um, in, in the news that have been recorded through either photography, whether it's moving or still photography. Um, a lot of cultural events and news events have been, have been caught with photography. So surveillance for sure. The first camera was known as camera obscura. So uh, that means dark room. So they usually were big rooms, but sometimes it was just kind of a bigger box where they could focus all the light uh, through a little tiny hole, which would be like a lens, and then it would project it onto the wall. Now it would project it upside down, which is exactly what our eyes do when it goes through the lens of our eyes they are upside down, our brain just kind of flips it back up for us. So if you've got a small enough hole, uh, you may have done this in school, They may, you can make a pinhole camera by just putting a little tiny hole and it focuses the light um, to create a camera obscura. So these were very, very uh, famous turn of the century type of idea. And they could also use that to trace subjects for a realistic drawing. So they would just have you sit there. Uh, a lot of these portraits were just in a camera obscura. So that was the first type of camera. Uh, then they decided to actually capture it because at the time they were just looking at it. So in 1826, this guy, Joseph Nibis, uh in France, he, uh, he made a camera obscura and then used an asphalt-like asphalt material and to try to put keep that image there. The exposure for this one photo that you're looking at was eight hours. So think of when the camera shutter opened, it stayed open for eight hours. It's a lot. The next type of uh, photography was called daguerreotype. Um, it was the first commercially photographic process. Um, inventor Jacques Daguerre. And these were very popular. Each daguerreotype was unique. There was just one photo. It was directly onto a piece of copper plate that had been put silver all over it. It was not flexible, pretty heavy. Um, it was very accurate, detailed. They were good photographs. Uh, it did have a mirror-like surface and it was very fragile. You needed to kind of not touch it which is why most of them were in frames like this, some type of piece of jewelry. They would be small because they were heavy. And if you touch them, kind of mess it up. So they would um, all be in a little frame or something. The idea of framing a photograph comes from daguerreotypes. So a lot of portrait studios opened up 1840 or so on um, all over the place. And of course, it was expensive for daguerreotype, so this was mainly rich people. But one of the things that was interesting is you had to sit very still because the exposure time was a really long time. So you see that this guy has this kind of stick going in the back of his head. That was literally to help him from not moving. So sometimes when you see daguerreotypes, the people look uh, really frozen and kind of bored because uh, they just had to sit there and stare at the camera for as long as they could without moving. <laughs> Here's uh, to show you kind of how the daguerreotype worked. Uh, they had the piece of, of metal and would kind of coat it with silver and they had to make sure to get that nice and straight. Um, they would expose it and then put chemicals on it that would bring out what the, what was exposed 
Uh, so it was a big process, a lot of dangerous chemicals, um, but we still have a lot of daguerreotypes around and a lot of cultural transmission coming from all of those. So you can find a lot of history in daguerreotypes. There are some famous ones around. There's Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams. Uh, probably the most famous are from a man called Matthew Brady, who did thousands and thousands of daguerreotypes during the Civil War. In fact, you can see uh, there's Lincoln. Uh, so he think about how heavy and dangerous these were. The chemicals were dangerous. He was out in the middle of war uh, with a horse and buggy with all of this heavy camera equipment. Um, it's not as easy as us just pointing our phones. And he got thousands and thousands of what was happening in the war. So this is the first journalism, really, for sure. And there's lots and lots of these photos that uh, shapes what, shape what we know of as the Civil War. Um, 1884, a man named George Eastman started the Eastman Kodak Company, you may have heard of. And he invented the idea of putting the film and rolling it up into a canister so that we could take photos. Um, this made it much more practical for newspapers uh, to use photographs and for regular people. These photos that you're seeing are regular consumer cameras from back in the day. Uh, so people were able to just take photos themselves. You didn't have to go to an expensive portrait artist to get your photos taken. This is uh, the type of camera we have now most of the time. It would be called a DSLR, which stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex, and meaning it has a single lens that did have uh, more than one lens before. Uh, so most of us have these. Most of the lenses are detachable. So that is what is a DSLR stands for. Now, most DSLRs also can shoot uh, video, which is good. Uh, in fact, this is why the DSLR is the main thing that journalists would be using. One of the things with journalists and photography is we have to make sure to av uh, avoid visual lies. We were talking about fake news and things like that in the other um, other chapter. Uh, here we have a photo of um, presumably um, somebody, you know, on war. <laughs> uh, this would be called documentary. So images of actual events. Um, you do have to, of course, it's cultural transmission. You're not, you should not change anything that isn't a documentary. So if this is where he fell, um, that's where we should. Um, this has been seen as um, a faked photo from way back when. So now sometimes you will see photos like this. This was a photo from CNN's website. This is called a photo illustration and it has to be labeled that way so that you're not um, lying to people, making them think this is something that's actual happening. This is actors. So if you use something like this in news to avoid visual lies, you have to label it as a photo um, illustration. They had it um, illustrated how to present the perfect apology. And I think people do understand through our media grammar that that is um, a, a photo illustration, not a real event. Um, it's not the truth, but it's not a lie. Why? Think about that. Um, so you have to be careful if you're using photography for journalism to ethically make sure that if it is not an actual event, that it is labeled as such. Now, a portrait um, can also sometimes be a visual lie in that you can see we kind of have this guy's skin has been fixed. Um, a a photograph of a person or a group uh, to capture the personality, it would be considered a portrait. Now, it's usually meant to, uh, to make the subject look nice, so which is why we would sometimes Photoshop somebody. Altering these are usually okay. Think about Instagram. People alter them all the time. But these are not to be used for journalistic representation of the person. Okay, so that kind of wraps up photography. Let's talk about movies. All right, so the primary function of the movie industry is entertainment. Cultural transmission also um, becomes important, but the primary function is entertainment. Um, technology not only recreates, but creates reality. Um, you know, actually, you know, science fiction is the perfect example of this. Um, in America, most commercially produced films are intended to make money, um, not art. Um, sometimes we do have some that are made for art, but most of the time the commercial industry is just to make money. 
All right, the history of the movie, movie, movie industry, sorry. So back before the turn of the century, Thomas Edison, we've heard of him before, right? It, not only the light bulb, but he also created something called the kinetoscope or sometimes known as a peep show because yes, sometimes it was not, uh, it was kind of dirty things going on in there, but you would just uh, put some money in the kinetoscope and look at it. And you can see here is the film going past showing you a pretty short little movie. Now, only one person could look at this at a time. That was kind of the first idea of movies was the kinetoscope. Then somebody called Louis and, two people, Louis and Auguste Lumiere uh, did the idea of a portable camera, how to process the film and a projector. So the idea of projecting this from not just being a peep show that a bunch of people could watch it all at one time was their idea. And they started the idea of going, instead of going to a play, you could go and watch a movie be projected to you. And that was a cinémagraphe de lumière. Sorry, my French, I don't know. Um, one of the first main filmmakers his name was George Millet. Uh, here is a link when you look at this PowerPoint, if you would like to kind of look a little bit more at him. But he was a um, big filmmaker. He was had the first idea for a double exposure, splitting the screen, the first dissolve. Um, he had a lot of these ideas of things that we use nowadays. He invented. Uh, let me see if I can get this to play for us really quick. This is his first movie, A Trip to the Moon. Uh, we showed this in my field ops class, but he had people uh, disappearing. It's pretty exciting. Let's see. This guy's going to disappear, you guys. Oh, so the idea of just turning the camera off, making that guy move away, and then turning the camera back on, that was his idea. That was revolutionary. We're talking, it wasn't even the um, 1900s yet. So um, actually, it says he did the first dissolve in 1899. That's a really, really long time ago. Now, of course, uh, let me go back real quick. You did notice that um, they just kind of shot it like a play. They didn't have the idea of close-ups or anything like that. And you heard the music. This was a silent movie. Uh, they usually would have an orchestra or somebody playing the piano in the theater while it was showing uh, because it was silent. In fact, uh, the beginning of movies, they were all silent. And like I said, uh, that was a good job for a piano player to play in the local movie house uh, while the movies were playing. So the silent era was first. We did get sound and color. Um, around the 20s, 1920s. There were also just a few movie moguls that were controlling everything and a few directors that were known as the auteurs, like Walt Disney, you may have heard of him. You also may have heard um, of these two brothers, the Warner Brothers and Samuel Golden. Those were the first director auteurs. The first talkie when we uh, moved from silent films into actually having recording audio and it was on the film with it was in 1927 starring Al Jolson uh, and it was called The Jazz Singer. Uh, it, that was the first talkie. It was uh, racist by today's standards and, you know, it, it was. Uh, he was in what, what we know as blackface. Um, Mammy, he would uh, sing. So anyway, that was the first talkie. So nowadays we have genres, um, you know, they're all kind of sub-genres, and I'm sure you have your favorite movie genres, action adventure, comedy, romance, science fiction, horror, Western, drama, documentary. There are a lot of them. And one of the ways that we, um, it helps us be able to market to different audiences uh, if we know what genre the movie is. So major studios are part of much larger media conglomerates um, today. We've talked about the large music companies, large media companies. The same thing goes with the movie industry. Um, average cost, it's actually higher than this, but a small movie would just be still about $70 million. Of course, a big movie like Avengers can be up to uh, $300 million. Marketing can add another three. 
30 to $50 million. So it is expensive to make a major hour, um, two hour long movie. These are the big players nowadays. Um, you just kind of look at that for a second and see how they're owned. And of course they have subsidiaries much like the music and, um, industry that we talked about last semester. I'm sorry, last chapter. So the process that they make these, the first thing they do is they develop a script. Uh, that's kind of what we teach in our classes too. Scripts come first. Then they're going to approve the project. They usually will go ahead and hire the director and the actors at that point. Of course, they shoot the movie then, post-production, and then distribution. They got to distribute it out, whether it's going to be in a theater or streaming or whatever. So that is the process that they go through. Now, once they get it done, they have to market it. So a lot, they are still using television as one of the main marketing tools. They advertise heavily for the first two weeks before the release, because nowadays it's nearly impossible for a movie to become popular uh, if they don't get that first weekend. I'm sure you've all seen that, that they really, really push for you to go see it that first weekend. That is one of the main goals with their marketing and distribution. So this is kind of the the way that they or, or the order that they go in. So first off, that they would or, do domestic theatrical release, meaning here in America. Then they go to international release. Um, a lot of our movies do really, really well in China and Russia. Then they go to video on demand where you can, you know, you guys know video on demand. And then it'll go to pay cable like HBO Showtime. Then it'll go to the networks, NBC, ABC, or cable TV, or streaming. And then it will go to syndicated TV, like when you're watching Sunday afternoons and they'll have an old movie on for you. One of the things that happened is we uh, went through a pandemic and it changed the way that they distributed movies. I think you guys all saw that. Now, if there is a movie theaters open, which for a while there weren't movie theater open, they would do all of the top three at the same time. So if they had movies open, they were um, putting them in the movie theaters, both here and internationally, and they were releasing it video on demand all at the same time. Uh, that absolutely was changed by the pandemic. Then they would go to pay channels like HBO, Showtime, then yada, yada, you understand. So I think we've seen that now, even though the movie theaters have opened back up in 2021, they still are going straight to video on demand. It has changed the way things happen. Memorial Day weekend, 2021, the movie theaters made a lot of money. Everybody was ready to go back to the movie. So domestic cinemas tallied nearly a hundred million dollars in ticket sales over Memorial Day. Um, a Quiet Place um, part two did really, really well. Uh, Cruella did pretty well. Um, oh, they're saying Cruella was also on Disney plus. So Cruella is the perfect example of what I was just saying is that they put it, um, on video on demand at the same time. Now still on Disney plus, you still had to pay for it. Even if you had Disney plus, you had to pay extra to see Cruella. So the business model of the movie industry. So it's really not too hard. You need to get as many people as possible to pay and watch your movie. And that's one of the reasons that all this video on demand and stuff has happened. Um, a lot of the actors got kind of mad at them for doing video on demand instead of being in the theaters. But, you know, it is a business. They just need to make money. So however they can do that, they will. Um, Assassin's Creed is a good example of a movie um, that was tied into a larger media conglomerate obviously was a game and all kind of things associated with Assassin's Creed. Um, audience, audiences are declining, but box office revenues have increased because of ticket prices. Um, subscription streaming revenues are increasing and licensing deals are creating revenue. So um, video games from movies, um, merchandise, that's um, licensing, TV shows from movies. What's the outlook for the movie industry? Well, the profound impact of digitization, we're able to shoot movies for a lot cheaper. We're able to distribute them for a lot cheaper. Um, 3D and other formats like that have really changed things. Um, one of the things about 3D is um, it makes it different than just watching it at home. You can 
make a reason for somebody to go to the theater. Um, writers have been adapting for different effects and um, distribution does save a lot of money. It used to cost them a lot of money just to make the film prints. Now they can just have them on a digital. All right, let's talk about television. Average viewer spends 11 years watching TV. I, I watch a lot of television. I do. I admit it. Now, more than two-thirds of home get TVs via, via satellite or cable, and that is even with cord cutting. Uh, TV and, um, I'm sorry, satellite and cable are still pretty prevalent. You do not have to have a TV to watch TV. Um, people your age are very, I kind of will say TV meaning video, and they'll be like, I don't watch TV. Yes, you do. You're just watching it on your phone or on your laptop. You're still watching what we would consider TV. So think of TV as just video programming that is not made for the theater is TV. Um, of course, in the 50s and the 40s, it was only on a television. Now it's all kind of different places, but it's still a TV. Speaking of the 50s, um, you know, TVs used to be this big, huge thing that was a piece of furniture. And now we carry, uh, a lot of y'all carry your TVs around in your back pocket. So that's kind of interesting to think about that. Let's talk about some of the technology that makes this possible. So something called the cathode ray tube <laughs> back in the 1800s um, combined the idea of the camera that they had come up with um, with electricity. So before they were um, putting this onto film, but they said, what if we use electricity? So the idea of the cathode ray tube uh, really started everything going with television. Now, there were two scientists who were um, trying to kind of work out how we were going to do this. Zwornick, which is this guy, and Farnsworth, which is this guy. And those are the two people that were battling it out to get patents for um, the idea of television. I have always thought that it was Farnsworth, but, um, you know, I'm not a true historian with all of this. So Zwornick and Farnsworth are both kind of considered the fathers of television. So they started, as you know, NBC was the first network. They were trying television back in 1928. And it was, um, they would only a tw two inches tall, little tiny, tiny screen. Uh, but no one really had TVs. We're talking just a few rich people. So they would just put out 20 minutes a day of this Felix the Cat. There you go. That was the first television. Um, here he is. He was just sitting there turning on a turntable, really small, sending it out to everybody uh, who had a TV, which was not very many people. Because what was happening is everybody was trying to do this new TV thing. And they were all just creating different sizes, different amount of scan lines. It's almost like when radio first started and everybody was just kind of throwing up radio stations and making all kind of different radios. So there were a lot going on. But we finally decided how we should do this, how we could have a standard that everybody would use. So the real start of television was at the World's Fair in 1939. They had the first NTSC transmission of television. And those of you who have taken my editing class know NTSC is the basis for our video that we have nowadays. So it no longer was a two inch uh, screen. They said, this is the standard that we are gonna stay with here in America. And uh, that was 1939. However, we had World War II, so that kind of halted everything for a while. But 1939 was the first time NTSC came around. So in 1941, the Federal Communications Commission, they approved that NTSC was going to be the standard for everybody. And they broke up the frequencies for television up into 13 separate channels. That is why today our three main channels in this market are channel four, channel seven, and channel 13, because they have been around that long. And those were the 13 channels that the FCC approved. Here's a map to show you uh, the NTSC standard, all of the different countries. You can see some over here who all were using NTSC, which of course is, as I said, the basis for the video that we use today. We have changed from NTSC, but it is still the basis of everything. Now, the golden age of television um, after, nine, you know, that was NTSC started, uh, was really 47 into the 50s. Things like I Love Lucy, The Twilight Zone, uh, the original Superman, the uh, 
leave it to Beaver. So that would be considered the golden age. And if you think about it, 1941 was when everybody just went out and started buying all kinds of TVs all over the place. So there you go. That is the golden age. Nowadays, we have high definition TV. So HDTV has uh, been around for just a little bit more than 10 years, 2009. So not that long. Um, the technology to go to HDTV has been in Japan since 1974. They went much, uh, they went to HD much, much sooner than we did. But the reason we didn't is because, um, our broad NAB, which is the National Association of Broadcasters and the mobile phone people, uh, so pagers, mobile phones, all that kind of stuff, were kind of fighting over the frequencies. If we went to HD, that was right there at the burgeoning of mobile phones. So they were, they were like, we don't want to give up area for the mobile phones. Remember the electromagnetic waves that we talked about? Uh, only certain ones could exist in certain places. So that's one of the reasons it took us a lot longer than Japan to go to HD. So we are now on the ATSC instead of NTSC. Um, it is based on NTSC, but HDTV uses the Advanced Television Systems Committee, uh, which is the digital standard for America. So ATSC stands for Advanced Television Systems Committee. And that is the basis of the TV that we have now. We did adopt that in 2009. So between all this, there was a lot of negotiation and fussing. I was working at a TV station and it was a really big deal. Who's going to pay for this? They were worried about, oh, the old people won't be able to understand that they were changing their televisions. Oh, my goodness. Uh, now, of course, we're getting into Ultra HD or 4K. Um, some broadcast programs are being in in 4K. Netflix has a decent amount of 4K. Um, so it's, we're switching to it, but still I would, the majority of people are just in HD and not in 4k. Uh, so to understand HD is 1920 by 1080, uh, 4k is bigger than that. Uh, some countries have 5k and then 8k is double that again. So if you double this, you get 4k, double that, you get 8k. So 8k is on the horizon. Um, <laughs> most people still are here in full HD. Now, if you want to know more about 8K, I think it's a little early to worry about that. <laughs> 8K is, uh, there's nothing being produced in 8K. So if you think, should I buy an 8K TV? Um, of course, it's higher resolution. Uh, so 1080 screens, we just talked about that. That is HD. 4K doubles that. 8K doubles that. Uh, so it's four times the, the amount of pixels. Um, there is no content. For 8K. So there is no reason to buy anything in that. There's really not anything in content. Um, yeah, there's no 8K out there. So, um, yeah, and things aren't even shot. Like, you know, everybody's re watching Friends. Friends isn't even in HD. I don't know how you could watch something, re watch something like Friends that was shot in standard definition. Okay, so how do we distribute distribute television programming, video programming? Of course, broadcast TV would be the traditional, just like radio, it goes over the electromagnetic waves. So broadcast television would be WYFF TV, WSPA TV, WLOS. They go over the air. You, do, you can pick them up for free. Um, so that is the affiliates and local stations, just like we talked about with um, NBC and the radio station affiliates uh, and networks. There is a network and that is what that is. It is free. Cable TV was developed in the late 40s um, in areas that like were in the mountains and stuff because the TV broadcast could not get to them. You've heard of bunny ears when they would just get they would have these little ears sticking up of their TV to pick up the TV signal. Well, if you lived in a, a part of a country that could not get the TV signal, you needed to get cable because you had really bad reception. Uh, so cable TV started for that. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So the um, broadcast TV is a way to distribute it. Cable TV is a way. Satellite TV. Um, the popularity of satellites really um, increased about 20 years old when they start. I'm sorry, 20 years ago when they did something called DBS, which is direct broadcast satellite, which was the small satellite dishes. You may still see some of the huge satellite dishes 
around when you're driving around in the country. But these were the small dishes. When those came around, the popularity of satellite TV really went up. When I worked at the TV station, um, our market had the highest concentration of satellite TV in the country. And the reason is because we are in the Piedmont or foothills and so it is hard to pick up TV signals here in our market. So there are a lot of cable and satellite TV in our market. And of course, internet television, um, many favorite of many millennials and Generation Z is not getting it from any of those other ways, just through the internet. So let's go back to cable for a minute. Cable started off as CATV, which stands for Community Antenna Television. And the idea here was, if they had a small town that was, uh, you can see this little town is in, there's hills all around it, so they couldn't get the broadcast signals. So they would put one big pole so that everybody could get, and then everybody would run wires from that to get their TV signal. That was the idea that started cable. So that was the first cable system. Yeah, the mountains would block it. Now, the main advantages of this, what is it just eliminated the over air interference? It wasn't so that they could get movies or any of the things that we think of cable now. It was literally just so that they could get better um, reception. And of course, they could get uh, more channels, but it was mainly because of reception. So this is basically how a cable system works. Most of their programming is got from satellites and they downlink it into the head end and then send it out to all of your houses. So you can see how that's very similar to the idea of way back when, when they just put one big rece receiver for everybody in the town. That's the idea of cable today, really. It's just on a bigger basis. Now, cable really was starting to threaten the broadcast networks for a long time. Uh, by 1997, the cable had captured a larger audience than broadcasting. So that really started shaking things up. So think about from the golden age of television where everybody was watching those uh, main networks. It really changed everything and kind of led the way to what we have now. In fact, it created something that you guys don't even realize has happened, while, which is narrow casting. Think back to the 50s, they would just make one show kind of expecting every age group, every type of person to watch. With the cable and what we have now with streaming, if you like sports, you can watch sports. If you like science fiction, you can watch science fiction. It's narrow casted into individual genres of what people like. Even the idea of kids cable TV uh, came along about that time. They were able to narrowly focus in on the, per, um, the different subgroups of people and what they wanted instead of just trying to have one big huge audience. Now another thing that really helped all of this distribution was the idea of satellites. So Telstar, there are a lot of Telstar satellites that are communication satellites and they launched um, in 1960 the first Telstar. Um, and the idea of geosynchronous orbit in the 60s uh, was a really big deal. The idea that a satellite could be up there and go as fast as the Earth so it was always in the same place. Uh, and we could always point up to it and get and know where that satellite is. That idea really helped be able to get programming around the world. If we didn't have Telstar and all of this stuff, we would not have all of the different programming on cable that we had for years and years and years. Um, yeah, so geosynchronous orbit is a high orbit. In fact, I believe it is 20, uh, right under 24,000 miles up. Um, and it matches the rotation of the Earth. So like I said, that satellite is always in the same place. Many of Americans are, of course, cutting the cable uh, and just going to streaming services. Um, this has really, really picked up because of the pandemic. Um, I have partially cut the cord. Um, I'm kind of half and half. Live streaming services, Sling TV and um, YouTube TV are almost like the old cable um, systems in that you can buy, instead of having to buy a whole bunch of different services, you can just buy one, like say Sling TV, and it has all of the stations, including local broadcast networks. And that's really important to a lot of people. It might not be important to you, but it's important to a lot of people. Um, and if you don't want to pay it all, there are a lot of free uh, streaming services out there and free live news. Of course, you have to pay for your internet. 
And this is just showing you how it changed because of um, the pandemic. Um, you can see pretty much everyone either watched a lot more TV or more TV. All right, the business model. Advertising is mainly how television is going to is makes money. Um, new, normally it is 30 second ads or one second, uh, one minute ads. Um, they also have infomercials, which would be, you know, a, a big hour long program. They can have uh, our half hour long program. You will see that the internet is also using these same commercials. Um, so that comes from television advertising. That's why it's many TV is free because they have advertising. Um, how do we know how much to charge for our television advertising? Um, we use a company called Nielsen and that is the ratings company for years and years and years. They measure how many people in different markets are watching particular television programs. Um, so if you've ever known anybody who has had a Nielsen's rating book, they are helping to determine how much money can be, um, how much you can charge for advertising on television stations. Now, cable and streaming has fragmented the audience and it's made the Nielsen ratings less accurate because there's so many different places to be watching the um, different video shows. Um, so, and there's also a lot of commercial free content um, if you pay. Uh, so Nielsen ratings are not as important as they were even in the 90s or the 2000s. Uh, and of course, there's also public broadcasting, NPR on the radio, on PBS, on television, which um, is paid for by donations and government help. So uh, there's also that. That's how they, they don't make money. They're just supported by that television industry. Um, well, we're entirely digital now. Um, our TV signal is completely digital, and that is moving us toward exclusively being digital. Um, online viewing and streaming is obviously changing everything. Um, of course, COVID-19 has really changed uh, media habits for young people and older people. We're going to talk about all of that here. Um, so during lockdown, we of course can do consumed unprecedented levels of media um, because everybody was indoor. Uh, consumption was not the same um, through different generations. The different types of media that we were consuming did, does hint at generation culture gaps. Um, if you want to read that, um, this is the same one, and it is about Internet time spent. So you can see how the quarantine's um, Internet levels went up for different generations. So you can see it went up for everyone. But say millennials did different things online than Generation X, which is me, Generation Z, which is most of you, uh, and boomers. Um, I am trying to stay off the internet. Oh, look, not very many people. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so media consumption for Gen Z, you can see uh, there is not that much broadcast TV. I do get that. Of course, look, physical press, no, they're not reading anything like that. Online video, absolutely, of course. But look how it changes um, even between Gen Z and millennials. And then uh, millennials and Generation X, like I said, which that's me. And you can see we watch a lot more of just traditional TV. Um, online press. Now, see, we still don't. In fact, we do less physical press than the millennials. I didn't know that. Um but we do uh, more online um, for news than millennials or Gen Z. Um, and still a decent amount of online videos. I mean, I watch a lot of online videos. So, And boomers, you can see, extremely different from all of the other ones. A lot of broadcast TV, um, still some online press, but mainly they are all broadcast TV. So that is the end of this chapter. Um, Hope you enjoyed it and I will see you next time.